Okay, so guys, today what we are going to do is we are going to answer the eternal question, why on earth do we need to know the quadratic formula? Some of you, sadly enough, know the quadratic formula because you learned a song that helped you memorize the quadratic formula. If you start singing that song, I will probably kick you out of class, just so you know. So, with that said, guys, what we are going to do today is we are actually going to start solving the equilibrium expressions that you learned to write previously. Now, guys, I know that some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, didn't we learn to do this last time, and isn't this just simple algebra? And the answer is, yeah, last year. But guys, that's about to change because what you're going to find out is that you can actually um, solve equilibrium expressions for which you know so little information that on the surface they appear to be unsolvable. Um, and so all we're going to do today, guys, is we're going to solve problems. Along the way, I'm going to teach you a new problem-solving construct called an ice box. Um, you are going to learn to uh, manipulate these. You're going to become very fond of these, and you're going to be doing a lot of these for the rest of the year. So we're going to introduce you to them today. So guys, this is what we're up to today. I would encourage you to not write this down, but if there's anything in your little world that is distracting you, I would encourage you to make it go away so that you can focus because this is not as easy as it looks regardless of how good I am at them, okay? So with that said, guys, don't write any of this down. Here's what we're gonna do today. You're gonna find out that when we solve these KC or KP expressions, um, this is what you learned to do last time. You were given concentrations at equilibrium and you solve for KC simply by setting up the expression and solving, or you were given KC and all but one of the equilibrium concentrations and you simply solve for the one that you didn't know. That's the stuff you already know how to do. Guys, this is where it gets a little more exciting. And this is where ice boxes become important. What you're going to learn how to do today is solve KC expressions when you don't know anything about the equilibrium conditions. You are going to be told, here are the initial concentrations, go get them. And that's it. And so that's where the math gets a little bit involved. That's where you're gonna use ice boxes. That's where you're gonna use the quadratic formula. So guys, what we're gonna to do today is we're just gonna pick these off one at a time. So let's start with some familiar territory, solving these problems where we know the equilibrium conditions. For example, this, let's solve it. You've got five minutes. It says the Haber process, for the Haber process, KP is equal to this at 500 Celsius. In an equilibrium mixture of the three gases, the partial pressures are this and this. What is the partial pressure of ammonia? Now guys, the first thing that you need to do is write a balanced equation. Now you're going, crap, I know I'm supposed to know the Haber process. Guys, I would encourage you to not look at your notes, don't look back, look up. Do not look back. There is enough information on the board for you to cobble the Haber process together without even having to go back and look at it. Yeah, you need to memorize it, but I would suggest to you that if you can be at least a little creative, and if you read through the problem a couple times, you can get the Haber process equation written without needing to look back. So again, you got five minutes, write a balanced equation, write the KP expression, plug in what you're given, solve for the partial pressure of NH3. And guys, if you're asking yourself right now, why can't I just go back and look at the Haber process because I know it's in my previous day's notes, guys, understand that a skill that you've got to develop because this is all headed towards that horrible test in May, you need to learn how to pick stuff out of the problems. Um, Many times the answers that you need are hidden in the problems and if you can practice the art of digging the answers out of the problems, you're going to be much more successful in May. So get digging.
wish there was a way we could pause the screencast. This is, oh yeah, yeah, it's five minutes of sitting there. Usually about three minutes into it, people start worrying that their computer crashed. Maybe periodically I'll just grunt to reassure them that things are still moving. So guys, my desire in solving these is that I don't need to grab a calculator. So I'm going to be asking you for numbers. Are we okay? Do you need another second or can we fiddle with it? I don't want to start fiddling until everybody's ready because maybe one of the most important parts is the first part. Can we go? Is anybody opposed to us moving on? Okay, then we're going to do it. So guys, as I mentioned to you as we started into this, um, first thing you need to know is a balanced equation. You need to know the Haber process. And again, at least it's familiar to you. And you may even have in the back of your mind that it's a synthesis reaction, but whether you do or not, guys, the reason that I didn't allow you to go look it up in your notes is because all the reactants and products are right there on the board, right? Because it gives you the partial pressure of H2, it gives you the partial pressure of N2, and you should, without even needing to see it, know that the product of something between H2 and N2 is going to be NH3. So all the pieces are right there for you. You just need to get them on paper and get it balanced. So guys, we know that our reactants are going to be N2 and H2. And then we know that our product is going to be NH3. Now that, of course, isn't balanced, but at least we have the pieces on the board. Then, guys, in order to make this thing balanced, we need a 2 here to balance the nitrogens and then a 3 there to balance the hydrogens. You good? Okay. So then from there, of course, we need a KC value. And our KC value will be NH3, and that'll be squared and then it'll be N2. Oh, that's wrong, isn't it? Yeah, nuts. Um, it'll be faster to do this. I forgot that they're giving us concentrate or NH3. Okay, so it's Kp is equal to um, the partial pressure of NH3, and that's squared and then the partial pressure of N2 times the partial pressure of H2, and that's cubed. Am I good? I think I'm good. Good? Good? Good. All right. So then, guys, we need the Kp value, and that's 1.45 times 10 to the negative fifth. And then it gives us the partial pressures of our product gases, but, or I'm sorry, our reactant gases, but not our product gas. So we go X. And then on the bottom, we've got the pressure of the N2, which is 0.432. And that uh, is atmospheres times the partial pressure of H2, which is 0.928. And that is also atmospheres. And that little fella is cubed. And guys, yeah, and I, I left that out on purpose. This is, these are, this is the mistake that you're going to make when you start solving these problems. It's very common. When you go back and read the grading, the, and I don't know if you guys have seen these or if I've mentioned them to you, every year that they grade a, an AP test, they actually have the graders write a summary of what they experienced in grading 100,000 of the same stinking question. And when we get to these types of problems, one of the common things that you see in the greater reflections is people just start dropping exponents. 
that one tends to go away. This one also tends to go away. So guys, when you're solving these, please be really careful with your exponents. So then as we go to solve this thing, I'd rather not do the algebra, but we can talk about it. So to solve this, we're gonna take this number and cube it. Then we're gonna multiply it by this. Then we're gonna multiply it by that. And then guys, what do we do to finally solve for x? Take the square root of whatever the product of those three multiplications are. Well, two multiplications in a cubing. And what do we come up with as an answer? 2.24 times 10 to the negative third. And don't forget units, atmospheres. Can we confirm or refute the answer? Are we okay? Are we good? And are we okay not showing you the algebra? Is that okay? Okay. So again, guys, this is a problem that I wouldn't have given you last year in AP or in general chemistry simply because it involves cubes and squares. Um, but the math is stuff you saw last year. You're given everything but one of the variables and you simply solve for it. Um, you could have also solved for KP given all of the equilibrium pressures. So things that you need to talk about there. That's last year's stuff. You're good? Okay. Now you need to start taking notes. So guys, now, and actually, you know what? I want to go back. Maybe we should have this conversation before we move on. Guys, it's critical that you understand this. You'll notice that as the problem started, we were given some pressures and then we solved for another pressure. Now guys, at what set of conditions are those pressures representative of this process? At equilibrium, right? So the thing that they're not saying um, is that this reaction didn't start there. That when the reaction started, it was at another set of pressures. And remember, it doesn't matter what they were. We could have had a lot of these and none of this, a lot of this and none of these, or a little bit of all of them. It doesn't matter. It will always fall to the same equilibrium. But the thing that is not expressly put out there in this problem is that this reaction went to these pressures at equilibrium. It simply says, equilibrium mixture. But the idea is the reaction didn't start here. This is where it ended up at equilibrium. You got the idea? Okay. Well, guys, that's what makes this a little bit more exciting. You now need to learn how to solve these problems when the equilibrium conditions are not known. And now you're going, wait, how can I solve an expression that represents equilibrium when it's not at equilibrium? And some of you may be thinking the answer is Q. Did any of you think of that? The idea that Q is, is the equilibrium is, is, is KC, but not at equilibrium. That's not the answer. Um, so how do we solve these when we don't know the equilibrium conditions? And guys, the answer to this, amazingly enough, has steps. Remember how last year in general chemistry, everything had steps? It was like every single thing you did had steps. And that's one of the things that stinks about AP is all the steps go away. We sort of teach you general principles. Well, this one actually has steps. So guys, when you're trying to solve these problems at non-equilibrium conditions, the first step, if you will, is to write a balanced equation. But guys, the format of that balanced equation is going to become important. Spacing becomes important, and I'll show you why in a minute. But I'm really going to step you through this slowly. So the first thing you'll do is write a balanced equation. Then, based upon that balanced equation, you will create what is called an ice box. Now guys, when you create this ice box, what you're going to do is this. You are going to allow X 
to represent the change in concentration that takes place between initial and equilibrium conditions. And once you do that, you will then use these variables to create expressions that represent equilibrium conditions without actually knowing what those conditions are. So what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with a lot of variables buried in our equilibrium expressions and those variables are going to represent change from initial to final conditions. Then guys what you'll do is once you've got this all set up you will then plug these expressions into the KP expression and solve for X and then you'll go back and you'll calculate the equilibrium conditions by taking that value of x and plugging it back into the initial expressions. You got all of that, right? You're good? See, this is why you have me. This is where I earn my money. We have a name for this. It's called not college. College, you get to go do this on your own. You can try. I'm not gonna help you. No, actually, you'd be amazed at how quickly in college you would outstrip the information that I would be in any means qualified to help you with. Oh yeah, if, when you guys get to OCHEM, <laughs> try coming by and asking for help. I'll uh, put my arm around you and give you a hug and wish you good luck, but <laughs> I got nothing. Oh yeah, it's, it's bordering on child abuse. If you weren't, if you were a minor, you could probably file a suit. It's horrible, horrible, yeah. No, I have, I have so completely repressed all my memories of OCHEM that I got nothing for you. No, it's three semesters. It's, well, four, um, because it's two, two lectures and two labs, at least at the U and BYU. When I did it, it was three because it was two lectures in one lab and you could take the lab either semester. But now they've broke the lab out into two individual labs. You guys all caught up? You're good? So guys, what we're going to do for the remainder of the day is we are going to solve two of these problems. I am not going to turn you loose on these. I'm not going to say, hey, go solve it and we'll get back together. This is going to be very, very much me modeling for you the way that this process works. So I'm going to go on. You guys ready? Here we go. So this problem, for example, um, if you would like a copy of the question, I would suggest that you can go print the notes. Um, I don't think it's worth our time to allow you the time to go write this down. Um, so print the notes, watch the screencast if you need. But guys, the, the question reads like this. It says that we have a mixture that is 5 times 10 to the negative third moles of hydrogen, 1 times 10 to the second moles of, of iodine. And this is placed in a 5 liter container and allowed to come to equilibrium. You analyze the equilibrium mixture and it shows that the equilibrium concentration of, of HI is that molarity. Calculate the KC for this reaction. Now guys, let's first of all help ourselves understand why this question is not like the previous question. So let's sort of talk about this here. So the first thing that we run into is some numbers and we've got moles of hydrogen and we've got moles of iodine. Now guys, are these amounts of hydrogen and iodine at equilibrium? No. Can you picture what's going on? You've got a tank of hydrogen gas and you take this many moles of hydrogen gas and you've got a vial with crystals of iodine. Iodine's a solid at room temperature. And you get a, you know, this many moles of the iodine, that many moles of hydrogen. Of course, you would actually need to figure out the volume of this and the mass of this. 
but then you would uh, place those in a vessel, a five liter vessel, and allow them to reach equilibrium. So this is where you started. You get the idea? Now, do we know anything about equilibrium? Well, guys, what's that? That's a concentration at what conditions? That one is at equilibrium. So when we say we don't know the equilibrium conditions, what we're saying right now is we don't know all of them. The next problem, we won't know any of them. But on this one, we at least know one. We know the equilibrium concentration of HI. So we're going to take advantage of that. But what they want us to do is they want us to solve for KC. And to solve for KC, we not only need to know the equilibrium concentration of HI, we need to know the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants H2 and I2. Okay, now let's talk about it. Are these things concentrations? They are not. They are numbers of moles. So guys, right up front, we understand that these numbers have very limited utility for us because they are not concentrations. They are empirically numbers of moles. So what do we need to do with these numbers first? We need to convert them to molarities. Molarity is moles divided by volume. How do we then convert those to molarities? What are we going to do? which is how many? Five. So we're going to divide these by five liters to make them molarities. Once we've converted them to molarities, do we now have enough information to solve for Kc? We do not, because even after converting these to molarities, they are not equilibrium molarities, they are initial molarities, and therefore they have no use to us as we're trying to solve for Kc. So guys, we've got sort of a multi-step problem. We need to write an equal, we need to write a balanced equation. Then we're going to need to convert these to molarities, but even after converting them to molarities, we still don't know their conditions at equilibrium, which we will have to infer from this ice box, and then we will finally be ready to solve for KC. You ready to go? Jonathan, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah, yep, for sure. You guys ready to do this? Here's the first thing we're going to do. We are going to write a balanced equation. Now guys, please don't write anything down until you watch me do this first. Because what you're going to find out is that the balanced equation that you write is actually going to become part of the skeleton for your ice box. So let's just talk really quickly about what our reactants are. What's reacting together? H2 and I2, and what's our only product? HI. So guys, we're gonna go like this. We're gonna go H2, leave a space, I2, leave a space, H, I. And guys, it would not be appropriate to make this the majority of the width of your paper. Okay. Thank you. You good to there? Okay. Now, guys, what we're going to do is we are going to take this and we are going to turn it into an ice box. Here's the way that you do it. You have the advantage of having lined notebook paper. What you're going to do is you're going to come down the left-hand margin and you're going to go I, C, E for your ice box. Now, guys, let's talk about, that's obviously, a, a, what, a, what am I, not an, is it an acronym? Where you take letters and the first letter is, stand, okay. It, it's an acronym. And so what does the ICE stand for? Do you know? So I is initial conditions. C is change. And E is, of course, equilibrium. So guys, what we've done now, and please don't do this with me, but let me just show you the mental construct. What we've done now is we have, and again, guys, please don't do this. We have now created a grid. We're not going to grid it in like that, but we have now created a grid. Now, with that in mind, let me show you our goal. In order for us to solve for KC, and that's our goal, right? In order for us to solve for KC, what we need is we need these three bottom cells filled in. 
because those are our equilibrium conditions and those equilibrium conditions then go in the KC expression to allow us to solve for KC. You get the idea? Okay, but in order to get there, what we need to do is we need to start filling this in. And now guys, the first thing that I'm realizing is that this is not balanced. So thankfully, it just needs that. Okay, so now, and Garrett, is that where you're going to mention? Yeah, okay. So guys, now that we have this thing balanced, what we're going to do is we are going to start filling out the grid. Now guys, the first thing that we need to remember, and I know we already mentioned this, this is an equilibrium process. And guys, think through this with me. This is going to be important. So when you originally learned about equilibrium, what determines where that equilibrium lies? Well, remember, it all comes back to rate expressions, right? And K values and things like that. But remember, forward and reverse rates are dependent upon the value of K and what else? Concentrations. So guys, when you're filling in ice boxes, you will never put moles in your ice box. The rates of these reactions are never dependent upon moles. They're dependent upon molarities. So you've got to have molarities. So again, we talked about it and Matt told us how. What do we need to do with these moles? Convert them to molarities, right? So guys, how are we going to do this? This is going to be a secondary calculation. And let me just tell you right now, guys, these get complicated. Organization is critical as you do these. Now let me sort of give you a little bit of foreshadowing. Eventually, once we have this ice box filled out, what we're going to do is we are going to write a KC expression, plug in the values and solve. So what you're typically going to want to do underneath your ice box is reserve six or seven lines to do that future calculation. But now we've got to do a preemptive calculation, which is convert to molarity. So where are we going to do that? Guys, you can do it off to the side. You can do it down low. If you have room, you can do it to the right. But I would certainly don't do it in the ice box and don't do it in the six or seven lines directly beneath it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get a clean screen and do it there. So here's what we'll do then. We will say that molarity is moles divided by liters. Our number of moles for hydrogen. Which one did we get first? Hydrogen. Our number of moles for hydrogen is 5.000 times 10 to the negative third. That's moles. And then our liters is five uh, and a bunch of zeros, right? Liters. So we divide that and we get one times 10 to the negative third molarity. Now guys, let me just tell you right now, I am going to be wildly, horribly, terribly, awfully sloppy with significant digits. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna write this number like this. Is that right, one, two, three, yeah. I'm gonna just write it like this. If you do that on the homework, if you do that on the test, if you do that on the AP test, it's wrong. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna represent this number like this simply to cut down on the clutter because right now I'm not trying to teach you significant digits, I'm trying to teach you the process. When you solve these on your own, keep track of significant digits, okay? So, did I do that math right? I think I'm okay. All right. And then, guys, similarly for our other calculation, we would have 1 times 10 to the negative second divided by 5 liters. Is that? Okay. Point, yeah, but I'm trying to keep, so. So. Oh, gosh, I just lost it. All right. So 0 0.002. We okay? You good to there? Okay. So 0 0.001 molar, 0 0.002 molar. So what do we do? So H2, guys, we now know that H2 is 0 0.001 molar. Where does that go in our ice box? Initial, top left. So this is 0 0.001 
molar. So initially, that is the concentration of H2. Now, guys, initially, what is the concentration of I2? 0 0.002 molar, which we also calculated. All right, so now guys, this is where the ice box becomes an amazingly powerful tool because it's a great way to organize in your mind how reactions move towards equilibrium. So we understand that these are the initial concentrations of H2 and I2. Now guys, we need to start getting creative. So the first thing is this, what's the concentration of HI initially? Y0. There isn't any. Guys, it does not mention charging the vessel with any HI initially. And so the only place that we can get HI from is the reaction of hydrogen and iodine. And initially that reaction has not begun. And so consequently, we have none of this. Do you see the logic behind that? Okay, so now that we've established that, let's turn our attention back to the question because contained in the question is actually a very powerful other piece of information. What else do we know from the problem? So we know the concentration of this. At what conditions? Oh. So this coming down to equilibrium is the concentration point 00187 molar, and that's the concentration at equilibrium. Good. Guys, it's at this point that the dominoes start to fall. You're sort of familiar with the idea that, you know, push, stack up dominoes, push them over. I know nobody does that anymore because you guys are also addicted to video games that you can't sit still long enough to set them up. But, uh, but guys, the idea here is that there's a chain reaction that's about to take place. So, and Micah, I think, was the first to mention it. We know that the hydrogen iodide started at zero. We know at equilibrium it went up to this. We therefore then know the chain. You get it? It went up by however much is, is present because it started at zero. So the change here then is 0 0.00187 moles. And that is positive because this went up. Now guys, do you see how this starts to fall together? If the hydrogen iodide went up by this much, what must have happened here? They went down by how much? Not that much. Half that much. Do you see it? Look at the stoichiometry. This balances with a two. So for every two of these that are created, we'll lose one of these and one of those. Does that make sense? So think about it this way. Let's use prettier numbers. What if we had 20 of these? Well, we lost 10 of each of those. It's half as much. So guys, the, the, uh, the consumption then would be 0 0.00187 divided by 2. I'm just going to round horribly and make this 0 0.009 and 0 0.009. And these go down. Oh no, I'm a zero short, aren't I? I was like, that subtraction doesn't work because that's bigger than this and that can't be. I got a, I'm missing a zero, 0 0.0009. Hello. Hi, what can I do for you? Oh, nothing. Wait, who are you? Oh, thank you. Well, I'm answer your phone with your phone. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this just said come to the office. It just says ASAP, so I send them down at the end of the day. I, ap I apologize. I didn't know that or I would have sent her down. Okay. Sorry. 
That's okay. Okay, so guys, do you understand where we are then? That it's 0 0.0009, that's half of the previous. You get the idea? Are we okay there? Okay, so now do you see what we can do? We now have a neat connection that allows us to figure out the final concentrations at equilibrium, because what do we do? We subtract. All right, so now let's do that subtraction. So we have 0 0.001 minus 0 0.0009, and so I get 0 0.0001, and 0 0.002, 0 0.0009, and 0 0.0011, and there we go. Is that right? Did I do okay? Cool. No? Am I okay? Cool. All right. So guys, do you see how that logic fit together? And guys, this is the way these things play out, that you identify all that you can and then allow the pieces to come together as you move around that. So the idea, the logic behind it is, if we knew how much this went up, we then know how much those go down. By knowing how much those go down, we can then calculate how what these must be at equilibrium. And now do you see what we've got? We've now got the concentrations at equilibrium that we can plug into KC. Do you see how that fits together? Is that okay? So there you go. Yeah? Yeah, so, so here, <laughs> well said. Uh, so you have to be given something. It wouldn't necessarily have to be this. They could have given you the, the, the final, con the, the equilibrium concentration of this. And then you could have inferred these. But if they don't give you anything at equilibrium, we can actually still solve them. And we're going to do that next. Okay. But in these types of problems, yes, you have to be given at least that. Is that okay? So guys, then you tell me, well, you know what? Maybe we should go ahead and solve this. So am I okay if I write down here? Is that okay? All right. So now guys, we're ready to solve this. And we're going to say Kc is equal to the concentration of Hi. And that would be squared. And then the concentration of H2 and the concentration of I2. And then we plug in our numbers. H2 is 0 0.00187. And that is squared. And then over here, we have H2, which is 0 0.0001 times 0 0.0011. And we do the math, and that would give us Kc. Does it feel like a letdown if we don't do the math? Let's do the math. Okay, so 0 0.00187 and divided by 0 0.0001 and divided by 0 0.0011 and up. And again, guys, being really not okay with significant digits, I get 31.8. What do you think? You okay? Things you want to talk about? Processes you want to explore? I don't know. We forgot about significant digits a long time ago. You guys okay? You got the process? Jessica. No, good. Guys, this is a really great question. What if the problem told us that we had an initial concentration of HI? No big deal. We can deal with that, right? It just means this isn't zero, which then means if they give us the final, the equilibrium concentration of that, we would just have to subtract to find the difference, which gives us this, and then again, the dominoes to start to fall. Yeah. So what if I then had a three in front of it? What would it like? If this was that yeah just for fun yeah. so then what would happen is if we identified this we would end up dividing by two and multiplying by three okay. right I mean we understand the idea and we could actually do that by coming back and writing a rate expression 
Remember those? So the idea though is pretend that that's not there. Here's a problem solving thought. So if that's not there, I think it's easy for us to say we should divide by the two. So if we know this, divide it by two to get these. So if there's a three there, we're dividing by what, what's in front of what we know. We would multiply by what's in front of what we don't know. Is that okay? What else, y'all? Great questions. You good? Yeah. Yeah. Not well. In in chapter twenty, they will, because we'll start talking about slightly soluble salts, calculating what are called KSPs, um, and then they will. But all that happens is this, um, and we'll talk about this in a month and a half. But this, you'll find out, has no concentration. Um, it's our product, it's a soluble salt that doesn't have a concentration. That's our heterogeneous component. So it doesn't have a concentration. So it doesn't show up in the KC expression and it has no values in the ice box. But we'll do that in a month. You guys good? All right. So guys, now we're going to solve another one of these where they tell us nothing about equilibrium concentrations. And to do this, we need the quadratic formula. Now's your chance. Do you need to sing the quadratic formula song? Do any of you know it? Good. Don't sing it. Here we go. So, guys, you thought we got crazy with significant digits previously. This is going to be even worse. But here we go. We have a one liter flask. We put a mole of hydrogen, a mole of iodine. We're doing the same reaction, right? Mole of hydrogen, a mole of iodine. We're at a different temperature, so Kc is no longer 30 whatever. It's now 50 something. Because remember the value of Kc is temperature dependent? What? Oh, it is? Oh, well, there. Is that at the same temperature? Oh. Oh, so without, really, the change by 15 without rounding? Don't round. Um, so, never mind, we're at the same temperature, and it works out to this without rounding. But it says, guys, what are the concentrations of H2 and I2 and HI at equilibrium? It's a good heavens, y'all. Are you guys familiar with the concept of swatting at gnats and choking on camels? You're going to walk out of here having no idea how to solve icebox problems, but you will understand that the preposition for does not belong in front of KC. <laughs> Okay, so one liter flask, one mole of hydrogen, two moles of iodine, KC is this. What are the concentrations at equilibrium? So I could turn you loose and let you write the ice box, but let's still do it together. So it goes like this. H2, I2, 2HI. And then guys, we set up our ice box structure. Now I am going to pause. Now let's do it together. What do we know? What information can we dig out of this problem that we can put in the ice box? What do you got? We can find the molarity of the hydrogen and the oxygen. Because I wrote this problem, I decided to use beautiful whole numbers. So I'm not even going to show the calculation. One mole of hydrogen, one liter flask, what's the molarity? One. Two moles, one liter flask, what's the molarity? <laughs> Where does it go? Are those initial, final, or change? One and two. Now let's talk. What is the initial concentration of HI? It's still zero. Now, what else do we know? 
We know KC, and that's going to be important later. But what else do we know that we can use to flesh out our icebox? Nothing. So what do we do? Well, guys, it's at this point that we start to infer change. And we didn't talk about this guiding principle earlier. We'll do it now. Guys, when we talk about change, what will the change for the reactants always be? Negative, because by definition, they're being consumed. What will the change for the product always be? Positive, right? So now, we don't know anything about the change. We don't know anything about equilibrium conditions, so we can't imply the change. So what are we going to do to represent change? We're going to use X. So, if this goes down by X, what will happen to I2? It will also go down by X. And if that goes down by X, what will happen to HI? It will go up by 2X. Good. Now, we can now carry these things down and write expressions for equilibrium. This will be 1 minus X. This will be 2 minus X. And this will be 2X. What? That's it, we're done. Okay. So now, guys, what we've got to do is we've got to plug these values into an equilibrium expression. Um, so I unfortunately don't have unlimited whiteboard space, so I'm going to go to a blank screen and start at the top. You can continue to work down, but I'm going to rely upon you to help me think through what I've got. Um, so we're going to go here and, well, we'll go here and there. Okay, so guys, I believe, and I'm not trying to make mistakes, so if I do, tell me. We've got H I squared H2 and I2. Okay, so then um, what was the KC value? Okay, so KC is 50.5 is equal to if memory serves 2x the quantity squared times the quantity 1 minus x times the quantity 2 minus x. You good? Okay. Now, guys, I, I, and I may be wrong, but I think that regardless of the functionality of your calculator, we need to get this equation into a general form. Um, I believe at that point, a lot of you have calculators that where you can just plug in the equation and it will resolve it for X, giving you both potential answers by chugging through the quadratic in the background. That's completely legal, okay? But I th am I right that together we at least need to get this into general form? Yeah. Okay, so in order to do that, we need to um, FOIL this. Do they still call it that? Okay, so what we've got then is we've got 50.5 times 2 minus 3x plus x squared equals, and this is where you're going to screw up, guys. What's the numerator of that equal to? 4x squared, like so. Then we need to distribute the 50.5 through, so we have 110. So 110 minus 151.5x plus 46.5 Forty-six point five x squared is equal to zero. What? Oh, thank you. Okay. So you're saying this should be one hundred one. Thank you. You're right. Um, and then, guys, did you see what I did here? 50.5 times x squared is 50.5 x squared, but then I subtracted the 4x squared from it. There's a name for that. It's called algebra. 
Then we need to reorganize this and we get 46.5x squared minus 151.5x plus 101 is equal to 0. Then we go negative b squared plus or minus the square root of 4ac all divided by 2a. So guys, do y'all have calculators that will resolve this? No? Don't know? Okay, so maybe we should actually spend the time to do this using the quadratic formula. Is it negative b? Yeah. Okay, so negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Then guys, this is your a, your b, and your c. So it would be 151.5 plus or minus the square root of negative 151.5 squared minus 4 times 46.5 times 101. All of that divided by 2 times 46.5. Then I'm going to climb up the side as we continue to solve this. So we would then have 151.5 plus or minus, resolving what's in parentheses. Why does that not look right? What's that? Am I okay? Oops. So 151.5. So guys, my two answers for this work out to 2.3 or 0.94. Can anybody confirm or refute? Thumbs up? Okay, we're, we're in the ballpark. Okay, so guys, please then understand, well, I'll let you catch up with me. We have a little bit of time. Guys, okay. Okay. Now, guys, we've got to be intelligent consumers of information. We have two answers, 2.3 and 0.94. But when we take those answers and put them in this context, we find out, down. let me write, let me write them down, our two potential answers are 2.3. And, and point nine four. Guys, when guys, when look at those, look at those answers two answers in context, we find out that one, one, one is non nonsensical. Which one? Which one? Two point two three. Why is why that, is that not, a not a valid answer? It generates, generates negative, negative concentrations. concentrations. And that's and impossible. That's so we so can explain this value. value. While the well, math suggests just the setting would not allow it. Allow it. And then, and then guys, guys, notice in a second, noticing the question says, what are the, what concentrations? Are the concentrations? Don't forget. Don't forget. 
This ain't the answer. Plug it in. It's 0 0.06 molar, 1.06 molar, and then 1.88 molar. Did I do that right? So guys, you're not done until you've taken that result, come back, plugged it into those expressions that you wrote, and then solve for the molarities. Nathan, go ahead. No, no, you'll... Always one of the answers will be invalid based upon the situation. Yeah, no. Yeah, because that wouldn't be possible, right? Because these reactions go to definitive sets of concentrations. Because the reaction can't be ambiguous, neither can our answers. So, you guys okay? You're good? Questions? So guys, maybe we should mention this then. What are they looking for on the AP test? So, and I never understand why they're comfortable with this. But guys, on the AP test, you are welcome to bring even programmable calculators into the test. The only thing that you can't have is a QWERTY keyboard. So if you were solving this on the AP test, um, what would you need to show? Well, let me show you. What you would have to do is you would have to get simply to there. And then at that point, you could just generate your answers. You do not need to show any of the quadratic formula. You just have to get it to there. Although, could any of your calculators take it from here and resolve it? May, I, it maybe you could even just go to here and be okay. You would certainly have to set up the KC expression. Sure. No, I agree with you, but I'm just saying you, you don't need to show any of the quadratic formula work. So, guys, anything else you want to explore? You're okay? All right. So, with that said, let's clear this. Let's clear this. Let's stop drawing dots. And, guys, there's your homework. We will grade this on Thursday. We'll wrap up the unit on Thursday, and then we'll talk about my extended absence on Thursday.